Hello and welcome. I'm Jeff Zeig. I'm the founder and the director of the Milton Erickson Foundation in Phoenix, Arizona. And here you are in our library and our boardroom. And why are you here? Well, you're here for the purpose of learning about psychotherapy. This is an introduction to our project about the Grand Masters of Psychotherapy. We're going to excavate the archives of the Milton Erickson Foundation, where we have videotapes, clinical demonstrations from masters of psychotherapy, the people whose work defined contemporary psychotherapy, who served as the foundation for inventing psychotherapy in the 20th century into the 21st century. I'm going to present to you videos of different masters and discuss them. You'll have the opportunity to uh, learn by direct experience, and you'll have the opportunity to see clips of masters as well as uh, entire videos should you choose to stream them from our archive. Just a little bit about my background. I'm primarily an experiential psychotherapist, somebody who, you, who, who believes that people best um, grasp adaptive concepts through the experiences that they live. This is based in my studies of hypnosis, which I've been practicing for pretty much 50 years, and uh, I'm beginning to get the hang of it. I think that I've gotten past the novice stage by now. But I, I'm a psychotherapy aficionado. I learn from many different masters and bring together many different approaches, so I consider myself an integrative, experiential psychotherapist. Now, uh, something about streams of psychotherapy. Let's just start with a little bit of history, trying to understand how psychotherapy developed. Now, psychotherapy can have many different purposes, and uh, it can be oriented towards people's thoughts or people's feelings or people's relationship patterns. And their psychotherapy, people come to psychotherapy from many different professions, from medicine, from psychology, from counseling, from social work, from marriage and family counseling. There's not one right field to present psychotherapy, and each of the different disciplines of psychotherapy uh, is based in different approaches of understanding the world. Now, going back into history, psychotherapy began in 1885 when Freud first became interested in the psychological aspects of medicine. Freud was somewhat of an experiential psychotherapist and in inviting people to lie down on a couch and free associate, and people got better quickly. And then as uh, the analysis developed, then people got better somewhat more slowly, and there was more of an emphasis on the practicalities of moving to a, a brief therapy model, especially as therapy was developed in the United States. Now, Freud was a biologist. He was a scientist. He was interested in a medical view of problems in the sense that we want to know causes. To Freud, you needed to know the cause in order to be able to provide the treatment, which certainly makes sense from a medical profession. If a person has a pathogen, of invading bacteria, you need to know the right spectrum antibiotic to be able to use. If you don't know the cause, you can't provide the treatment. But in terms of psychotherapy, this may not be the case. And this view has been successfully disputed. You don't necessarily need to know the cause to help somebody to overcome their phobia or their uh, a bad habit or their unsuccessful relationship pattern. Now, there are streams of therapy. Therapy developed in Europe out of a European tradition of wanting to know why. So it's not clear about what to address. What are the focuses that psychotherapy should have? Is there a correct focus? And my belief is there is not a correct focus. There's uh, choice points and orientations. Do we want to focus on helping people to change their personality? Do we want to focus on the problems that people have? Do we want to help them to understand the history that's made them who it is that they are? Do we want to focus the therapy on growth, on achievement? There's no right choice. That's just a short list of many. But when you think about the major streams of psychotherapy, therapy started in the European tradition with the work of Freud and Adler and Carl Jung, 
and again, basically trying to understand why are people the way that they are. As Europe was decimated by World War II and psychotherapy emigrated to, to the United States, there was more of an emphasis on American practicality. What do you do? We had the development of behavior therapy. How can we focus on the things that people need to change in order to live more adaptively? What, what are the ways we can recondition people? There was concomitantly the development of the humanistic approach to psychotherapy based on the work of people like Carl Rogers and Fritz Perls, where psychotherapy was a growth-oriented experience and not necessarily focused on how do you um, surmount specific problems. Somewhere along the way, there was the development of existential approaches based on the philosophy of existentialism, based in the work of Victor Frankl and Rollo May and Irv Yalom, focusing on relationship, focusing on meaning. How do you live life in a meaningful way? And if you're living life meaningfully, probably the psychosocial problems that are troubling you are going to be less imperative. Now, in the 1950s and thereafter, is the development of systemic schools of psychotherapy. Can we understand the family system as being operative in understanding how a person is the way that they are and how it is that they can change? You can change relationship patterns. You don't have to focus on the identified patient. We had the work of people like Salvador Mnuchin and Carl Whitaker and Murray Bowen, Virginia Satir, Paul Watzlowick, Jay Haley, luminaries as I was developing my own craft of being a psychotherapist. These are the people I was very, I was avid about learning. If you can make a change in the system, in the relationship contextual pattern, people respond uh, and symptoms can be uh, relieved uh, by not even focusing on the behaviors or the emotions that are involved, but focusing on relationship patterns. Uh, more recently, we had the development of cognitive schools, the work of Alan, Aaron Beck, Tim Beck and his disciples, and Albert Ellis, uh, changing some of the attitudes that people have uh, and changing some of their negative cognitions into more positive cognitions. I think of Erickson as being a separate school and uh, developing a, an experiential approach, a strategic approach to psychotherapy, explored by his expositors, me being one of them, but also Jay Haley and Chloe Madonnas. And then most recently we have a, an affective neurobiological approach to psychotherapy. How do we understand brain functions and certainly two of the pioneers in this area were Ernest Rossi and now Dan Siegel, and uh, understanding that if we know something about affective neurobiology, that may guide us in creating interventions. Now, I just was outlining the development of psychotherapy in broad brushstrokes, but if we looked into Erickson's work, into genealogy that expresses the people who Erickson influenced, Wow, this is an extensive outline of uh, different branches of schools of psychotherapy that were essentially um, stimulated by studying the work of Milton Erickson or with Milton Erickson. And probably we could create a similar genealogy for cognitive therapy or uh, family therapy. So it's not that these uh, schools are um, complete within the description that I just gave you. There's lots of offshoots. Now, the essence of this presentation, what it is that I want you to get as a way of introducing you to the different masters of psychotherapy is about choices that these masters have made. What is the fulcrum that they've chosen? What is the essential element of communication? The elements of communication are not only about communication, they're also about symptoms. Every symptom is a compilation of elements, just as every communication is a compilation of elements. And we may choose one element as a focal point, but uh, not necessarily the focal point. It's just a, a place where we can begin. 
and uh, one element of communication is affect. Let's say I say it's really a beautiful day today. Well, you could respond by saying, Jeff, you feel good today. And you would be responding to the underlying affect of me saying, it's really a beautiful day, that there's an affective component. We're going to see this in the work of Rogers. There's a cognitive component because I'm talking about an experience of the day rather than the experience of the office. And uh, that could be a focus of psychotherapy too, to focus on some of the cognitions that lead to distorted beliefs. We could focus on behavior because if I'm saying it's really a beautiful day, there's a behavioral expression that goes along with that. And that could be the focus of therapy because every symptom has affective components, cognitive components, behavioral components, also sensory components. How do you perceive the day and how do you represent it internally? If we looked roughly at the School of Neurolinguistic Programming, an emphasis in that school would be about perception. Um, physiology, every communication is based in a biological event. We can change depression and change uh, anxiety by the use of chemical interventions. There's nothing wrong with that. They're, not, uh, they're part of the repertoire of psychiatrists and nurse practitioners who are doing psychotherapy. But every communication says something about a relationship. And if we can change relationship patterns, relationship dynamics, that may be a central way of thinking about psychotherapy. In other words, there's no correct way. Now, it would be nice to say that these six elements, primary elements, as I call, call them, just to make a distinction, that if all communication was based in these six elements, therapy would be easier and uh, we would know more about how to approach the task. But there are secondary elements in that they modify the primary elements. If I say it's really a beautiful day, I could have an attitude about that. I could say, wow, that was a great thing to say or that was neutral attitude. That was an interesting thing to say, or I could have a, a negative attitude. Oh, that was really stupid. Why did you even say that, Jeff? And this is a part of a fulcrum where Albert Ellis, in his work with rational emotive behavior therapy, would focus on attitudes. There are quantitative develop aspects to communication that really don't become uh, 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 focal, but it's really a beautiful day. It's really a beautiful day in changing the intensity and duration and um, that uh, could be a focus that we could have in approaching a particular problem. And there's contextual issues that every communication is unique and that it happens only in one time in one place. And there do happen to be schools of psychotherapy that are under the rubric of being contextual. There's symbolic approaches to psychotherapy. Certainly that shows up in the work of uh, Jung and uh, the disciples uh, who practice a Jungian approach to psychotherapy. All communication is ambiguous in that it can't be fully specified. Um, there uh, are elements in Erickson's work where he uses the ambiguity of communication communication is idiosyncratic because it's an idiosyncratic representation of the history and experience of the communicator. But there are also historical aspects to communication, existential aspects to communication, spiritual aspects, cultural aspects to communication. There's no ending of the number of categories about communication. Now, every problem is a compilation of these elements, primary and secondary. Every intervention in psychotherapy is a combination, probably, of these elements, although experts will focus on one of the elements and saying, this is the holy grail, this is the way to approach the task of psychotherapy, but really there's no right way. This is a system. The, all of the elements of communication form a system. If you change a systemically significant number of elements, the title changes. How can we think more broadly about taking expertise from the grand masters that I'm going to present to you 
incorporate them into our work and become more technically eclectic in our approach so that we can use some of the expertise that has been explored by these master therapists. These are from the archives of the Milton Erickson Foundation. We're going to mine the archives from some of the meetings that have been organized by the Erickson Foundation, especially from the Evolution of Psychotherapy Conference, the premier conference that I've organized through the auspices of the Milton Erickson Foundation. And uh, you will have the opportunity to see demonstration therapies, sessions in which we can look at what a master is doing. I can give you my impression of what the focal point of this is. We want you to have takeaways, things that you can immediately incorporate into making yourself a more effective, a better psychotherapist, somebody who really enjoys your profession and explores the possibilities that are available in psychotherapy from a number of different angles. Join me on the adventure. I'm glad that you're with me and hope that you enjoy the journey. I certainly enjoy the journey myself and it helps me to improve my craft. Thank you so much.